We live in a world where there is more and more information and less and less meaning. The neighborhood is nothing but a protective zone, remodeling, disinfection, a snobbish hygienic design. But above all, in a figurative sense, it is a machine for making emptiness. The possibility of an ideological analysis of Disneyland as a digest of the American way of life. Panagreic of American values, idealized transposition of a contradictory reality. Certainly. But this masks something else, and this ideological blanket functions as a cover for a simulation of the Third Order. Disneyland exists in order to hide. It is the real country of all real America. That is, Disneyland. A bit like prisons are there to hide that it is the social in its entirety. In its banal omnipresence, that is, carceral. Disneyland is presented as imaginary in order to make us believe that the rest is real. Whereas all of Los Angeles and the America that surrounds it are no longer real, but belong to the hyper-real order and to the order of simulation. It is no longer a question of a false representation of reality, ideology, but of concealing the fact that the real is no longer real, and thus of saving the reality principle. But what if God himself can be simulated? That is to say, can be reduced to signs that constitute faith. Then the whole system becomes weightless. It is no longer anything but a gigantic simulacrum, not unreal, but simulacrum. That is to say, never exchanged for the real, but exchanged for itself in an uninterrupted circuit without reference or circumference. We live in this world, which for us has all the disquieting strangeness of the desert and of the simulacrum, with all the veracity of living phantoms, of wandering and simulating animals that capital that the death of capital has made of us, because the desert of cities is equal to the desert of sand. The jungle of signs is equal to that of the forests. The vertigo of simulacra is equal to that of nature. Only the vertinuous seduction of a dying system remains, in which work buries work, in which value buries value, leaving a virgin, sacred space without pathways, where only the wind lifts the sand, where only the wind watches over the sand. Animals have no unconscious because they have a territory. Men only had an unconscious since they lost a territory. And so art is everywhere, since artifice is at the very heart of reality. And so art is dead. Not only because its critical transcendence is gone, but because of reality itself, entirely impregnated by an aesthetic which is inseparable from its own structure, has been confused with its own image. Reality 
no longer has the time to take on the appearance of reality. It no longer even surpasses fiction. It captures every dream, even before it takes an appearance of a dream. One has never said better how much humanism, normality, quality of life, were nothing but vicissitudes of profitability. It is dangerous to unmask images since they dissimulate the fact that there is nothing behind them. Power floats like money, like language, like theory. What becomes of the divinity when it reveals itself in icons, when it is simply incarnated in images as a visible theology? Or does it volatize itself in the simulacra that alone deploy their power and pomp of fascination. The visible machinery of icons substituted for the pure, intelligible idea of God. This is precisely what was feared by iconoclasts whose millennial quarrel is still with us today. This is precisely because they predicted this omnipotence of simulacra. The faculty simulacra have of effacing God from the conscience of man and the destructive annihilating truth that they allow to appear. That deep down, God never existed. Even God himself was never anything but his own simulacra. From this came their urge to destroy the images. If they could have believed that these images only obfuscated or mask the platonic idea of God. There would have been no reason to destroy them. One can live with the idea of distorted truth, but their metaphysical despair came from the idea that the image didn't conceal anything at all. We need a visible past, a visible continuum, a visible myth of origin to reassure us as to our ends, since ultimately we have never believed in them. Hell of simulation, which is no longer one of torture, but of subtle, maleficent, elusive twisting of meaning. Forgetting extermination, is part of extermination. There is no more hope for meaning. And without a doubt, this is a good thing. Meaning is mortal. Appearances, they are immortal. Invulnerable to the nihilism. This is where seduction begins. Whereas representation attempts to absorb simulation by interpreting it as a false representation, simulation envelops the whole edifice of representation itself as a simulacrum. Such would be the successive phases of the image. It is the reflection of a profound reality. It masks and denatures a profound reality. It masks the absence of a profound reality. It has no relation to any reality whatsoever. It is its own pure simulacrum. The old slogan, truth is stranger than fiction, still corresponds to the surrealist phase of this aestheticization of life, is obsolete there is no more fiction that life could possibly confront, even victoriously. It is reality itself that disappears utterly in the game of reality, 
radical disenchantment. The cool and cybernetic phase of following the hot stage of fantasy. Today, abstraction is no longer that of the map, the double, the mirror, or the concept. Simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being, or a substance. It is the generation by models of a real without origin or reality, a hyper-real. It is from the death of the social that socialism will emerge, as it is from the death of God that religions emerge. It is useless to dream of revolution through content, useless to dream of a revelation through form, because the medium and the real are now in a single nebula whose truth is indecipherable. To dissimulate is to pretend not to have what one has. To simulate is to feign to have what one doesn't have. One implies a presence, the other an absence. But it is more complicated than that, because simulating is not pretending. The only weapon of power, its only strategy against this defection, is to re-inject the real and the referential everywhere. To persuade us of the reality of the social, of the gravity of the economy, and of the finalities of production. By crossing into a space whose curvature is no longer that of the real, nor that of truth, the era of simulation is inaugurated by a liquidation of all referentials. Worse, with their artificial resurrection in the systems of signs, a material more malleable than meaning, in that it lends itself to all systems of equivalences, to all binary oppositions, to all combinatory algebra. It is no longer a question of limitation, nor duplication, nor even parody. It is a question of substituting the signs of the real for the real. That is to say, of an operation of deterring every real process via its operational double. A programmatic, metastable, perfectly descriptive machine that offers all the signs of the real and short circuits all its vicissitudes. Children are simultaneously required to constitute themselves as autonomous subjects, responsible, free, and conscious, and to constitute themselves as submissive, inert, obedient, conforming objects. Pretending or dissimulating leaves the principle of reality intact. The difference is always clear. It is simply masked. Whereas simulation threatens the difference between the true and the false, the real and the imaginary. If being a nihilist is carrying to the unbearable limit of hegemonic systems, this radical trait of derision and of violence, this challenge that the system is summoned to answer through its own death, then I am a terrorist and a nihilist in theory, as the others are with their weapons. Theoretical violence, not truth, is the only resource left to us.
This is what terrorism is occupied with as well, making real, palpable violence surface in opposition to the invisible violence of security. Simultaneously, in the most complete ambiguity, they, the media, propagate the brutal charm of the terrorist act. They are themselves terrorists, insofar as they themselves march to the tune of seduction. Melancholic and fascinated, such is our general situation in an era of involuntary transparency. You no longer watch TV. It is TV that watches you live. Or again, you are no longer listening to the don't panic. It is don't panic that is listening to you. A switch from the panoptic mechanism of surveillance, discipline and punish to a system of deterrence in which the distinction between the passive and the active is abolished. There is no longer any imperative of submission to the model or to the gaze. You are the model. You are the majority. Such is the watershed of a hyper-real sociality in which the real is confused with the model. As in the statistical operation or with the medium, such is the last stage of the social relation, ours, which is no longer one of persuasion, the classical age of propaganda, of ideology, of publicity, etc., but one of deterrence. You are information. You are the social. You are the event. You are involved. You have the word, etc. An about face through which it becomes impossible to locate one instance of the model, of power, of the gaze, of the medium itself, because you are always already on the other side. The simulacrum is never that which conceals the truth. It is the truth which conceals that there is none. The simulacrum is true.